There has been death in the opposite house was written by a, by a, very, a famous American poet. If you go to footnote number 23, you'll read something about the poet. A famous American poet known for her sad and pessimistic poems. Most of Emily Dickinson's poems are sad and pessimistic. And most of them, most of the poems written are about death and nature. Death and nature. After the death of her father, why? Why is it death? Why should the young woman talk about death? Because after the death of her father, she lived a reclusive life away from her society and men. She excluded herself from all of the people around her. After the death of her father, Emily Dickinson, I'm talking about the poet now. I'm talking about, we're talking now about the poet. She had, um, she had a very hard life, a reclusive life, just like Miss Havisham, if you remember her. You remember Miss Havisham? Do you remember Miss Havisham in uh, uh, Great Expectations? <coughs> yes. Miss Havisham also had a reclusive life based on a shock. She was shocked. Somebody stole her money. Somebody stole her money and ran away with her wealth. She refuses to get out of her house. That is, that is the strange part of this woman. She refuses to get out of her house into the outside. She started to fear every, everything and everyone outside her house. And as a result, she wrote most of her poems in her room. The poem is composed of <coughs> quatrains. What's a quatrain? A quatrain is a stanza of how many lines? There are four lines in a quatrain. A quatrain is a stanza of four lines. It is six quatrains. Each quatrain normally consists of four lines. This is the structure of the poem. Let's get to the meanings. There has been death in the opposite house. The speaker opens the poem with the title of the poem. What's the title about? There has been a death in the opposite house. Opposite. In the opposite house. In the front house. Across from the street, there is a house. And in that house, there has been a death case. There is a, ha there is a death uh, case. Somebody has died in that, uh, in that opposite house. Well, there has been death in, a, in the opposite house as lately as today. As lately as today. It happened exactly, and I'm not quite sure, it is... A, ca a case of death in the opposite house, but I, I'm not quite sure when it exactly happened, but it is as lately as today. The speaker is not quite sure when there is the de when was their death in the, in the opposite house. But it was happened, it happened today, as lately as today. Is the speaker sure? He's not sure. He is not sure about where, wh when exactly the death case happened. I know it by the numb look. I know it by the numb look. Such houses have all way. Numb. What is numbing? What is to numb? Numbing, as, yes, <clears throat> as the American English, it's like deprived of the power of sensation. When you lost the sensation, when you lost feeling, when you lost feeling of your hand, I can say I have got a numb hand. When you lost feeling of your, of your leg, then you got a numb leg. Remember, sometimes you sit for a long time on your leg. And then when you start to get up, you feel like your, your leg is numbing. Numbing. You can't move it properly. It's not a drug. No, no. It's not, it's not like drugged. No, no. You don't, you don't have drugs. It's like the rush of the blood started to gush out of, it, it's got to start to gush into your leg. The speaker can guess it because the house in front of him, the, the speaker is, some, is someone who is not in, uh, in the street, for example. The speaker is looking to the opposite house from 
the speaker's room. And from his room or her room, we don't know. We need to identify the speaker, brothers. We need to identify the speaker. Is the speaker a man or is the speaker a woman? We have to check that. And also, we've got to be aware of the setting. Setting of the poem. The, the sec, what, is the pla what are the places? What's the time? The speaker can guess that there has been death in the opposite house, which has happened as lately as today. Well, how did he know? How did the speaker know? Did he get out of his room, out of his house, to go into the opposite house and check? Did he check? Did the speaker check about the death of the house? No. The answer is no. Why? Because he knows it. He knows it, or she knows it, by the numb look, by usually the normal positions of houses that have death cases. How do you think, how do you think of a house where we have a death case? Do you think this house, house will, will be and act and look the same way as it looks every day? The answer is no. Why? Why? Because whenever we have a death case in any house, normally many activities in the house are many activities are paralyzed. Children do not go to school. Uh, mothers and sisters do not act normally. They don't cook breakfast or dinner. They don't like to cook anything. They don't like to tidy everything. The people in the house usually are alone and separated. Usually, you know what happens when a death case happens and when there is death in the house. You following me? Whenever there is death in the house, normally we know what happens. We just feel that the house is not normal. No dinner, no cooking, no food. Uh, nobody likes to cook anything. Nobody likes to buy anything. No jokes. You know, uh, children don't go to school if there are children in the house. Uh, people just keep rushing in and out. Right? Isn't this the normal positions of a house where there is a death case? It becomes weird. That's right. It becomes weird. It becomes strange. It becomes strange. Well, the speaker says, I know it. I know that there has been death in this opposite house, which is in front of me. Not because I got out of my house and visited there. No, but because of the following observations. These are the observations that the speaker has for evidences that there has been death in the opposite house. Now, I've got a question, brothers. Usually, always is written with an S, right? Usually, always is written with an S. But here, it's without S. It's all way. I know it by the numb look such houses have all way. Where is the S? Why did the poetess drop the letter S? Any answer? Drop the letter S in here. Because usually we have the word always. The word is always. But it's all way. In the poem, it's all way. What about the S? Where is the S? Why did it, why has it been dropped? It's called poetic license. Yes. Poetic license. Good. What is the poetic license? To drop it. Why? Where is the urge to drop the letter S? Now, imagine, if the word, the letter S remains there. Do you think it's going to rhyme with the word day? Do you think the word always will rhyme with the word day? Now, let's see. Let's check. There has been death in the opposite house as lately as today. I know what by the numb look such houses have always. I don't think this, the rhyme system will remain the same. That's why day has got to rhyme with all way. You got that? You got that? It's the rhyming scheme. 
it's the rhyming scheme. I think you have got this in the question here. Why did the poet drop the S from always to keep the answer? It's here. You don't want to read a what? It's here to keep the rhyming scheme. What is the rhyming scheme? The word day has to rhyme with the word alway, right? Let's see what the poets have got to mention in observations. His observations that makes him determined. Determined or reach to the determination, or that, sorry, to the confirmation that there has been death in the opposite house. First, the neighbors rustle in and out. <clears throat> the first observation in the house, in the house of the death, is that there are a lot of neighbors who keep rustling in and out, who keep rushing in and out. What is to rustle? What is to rustle? It's like to make it's to make a movement, a sound with a movement. It's like when you move and make sounds. When you move quickly or in a hurry and you make sounds with that. The neighbors rustle in and out. In and out of what? In and out of what? Definitely of the house. Of the house. But this is between brackets. Or the neighbors keep rushing in and out of the house. And I think you know why neighbors have to rush or rustle in and out of the house in a hairy way, in a quick, in quick movements, in sound producing moves. Because the neighbors have to support, to give help, to give condolences. Why do, they have to, why do the neighbors have to go in? Why do we neighbors have to go to the people's, uh, to the house of the death? Because we have to show some support. We can provide food. It's not only Abi Jafar al Maybe they need food. Maybe they need condolences. Maybe they need someone to comfort them. So they need things. People of the dead usually need, or relatives of the dead, I can call them. Relatives of the dead need some condolences. What is condolence? Any idea? Usually, what do we tell to the relatives of the dead? What do we say? We give condolence. We just have to make it easy for him so that they get over it. We have to talk with the relatives. We have to comfort them. We have to make, to make, to, to make them feel easy for that. They should not panic. They should not cry. They should not. Why? Because we have to give them condolence. That's why we are there. The neighbors rustle in and out because they are busy with the relatives, with the, they are busy with the mourners of the dead, they are busy with the relatives of the dead, and they also have to give help, to support help, to show some help to the, to the dead. This is first evidence, or first observation. The doctor. The doctor drives away. The speaker could notice that the doctor has driven away. Well, there has been a doctor in the house. Then, because there is a there was a doctor, then there must be a patient, a patient who could not make it, a patient who has died of his disease. The doctor drives away is denoted denotes something. It connotes something. <clears throat> it connotes that the doctor could not help the patient. That was why the patient had to die. The doctor drives away is another indication that there was a death, there is a death case in the house. The speaker in the poem does not want to tell us that he has got out of his house, got out of his room maybe, to, go, to get downstairs and get out of the house to talk to the relatives of the dead, to get into the house of the dead. The speaker is sort of like separated, isolated. He's watching everything from above. He's watching everything from above. The neighbors rustle in and out in a very hysterically crazy way. The doctor drives away in an indication to the fact that the man or the woman who has died was already sick. 
the dead has already died of sickness or some illness, some <clears throat> chronic illness, something like that. A window opens like a pod. A window opens like a pod. Abrupt mechanically. Here, opens like, or I think you understand the meaning of a window. There is a window. In the house of the dead, there is a window. And this window opens like a pod. We got what figure of speech is in here? What figures of speech do we have in here? We have got a simile. Because we have the word like. We have got the word like. So we've got a simile. Well, what is the simile? The speaker compares the opening window to the opening of the pod. What's a pod? What's a pod? <clears throat> a pod, first of all, a pod, biologically speaking, is, um, is that opening growth. What's a pod? The pod is that opening growth of a plant. A pod is a small opening in the plant, after which we have a growth of a leaf or the growth of a fruit or a growth of a flower, particularly, yeah, particularly peas and bean. That's right. Particularly in the peas and in the beans. In Fasulia, you know, the, the pod has to produce the fruit. But before that, it's the flower. Then the pod opens into uh, the fruit. A window opens like a pod. The window of the house opens like a pod in the sense that it's, first of all, it's, it's, not, um, it's not expected to open that window in the morning, for example, on that, or in that particular day of the, uh, time of the, day, of the day or of night. The, the windows are open, and everything, every time the windows is open, something is thrown out of the window. Something is thrown out of the window. Abrupt and then mechanically. Abrupt means, uh, abruptly means suddenly. Abrupt means occasionally. It's not on a normal basis. It's not on normal basis. It's like abrupt means it has to, the, the windows is open whenever occasion arises. Whenever the occasion arises. The, well, why do we have the, window, the windows open? Why do, they have, why do the, the relatives have to open the window? Somebody flings a mattress out. Somebody throws. Somebody tosses a mattress out. Uh -huh. Well, out of what? Out of the window. Out of the window. Mattress. What is mattress? Mattress. It is where we sleep on. Mattress. On the bed, we put mattresses. And on the mattresses, we sleep. On the bed, we put mattresses. And on the mattresses, we sleep. Somebody has flung or somebody flings a mattress out. Flings, if you go to footnote, flings is to throw. To fling is to throw. To toss a mattress out of the house through the window. All right. What happens immediately then? The children hurry by. The children of the neighborhood hurry to gather around this mattress. Why? They wonder if it died and that. They start to wonder. They start to give questions. If the dead died on that mattress. That refers back to mattress. Usually, children are curious. You know. Children are curious. They just want to know what's happening, what's going on. So, <clears throat> the mattress of the dead has to be thrown out of the window into the pavement or the sidewalk. And usually the children hurry by this 
to uh, in order maybe to pick that mattress to the garbage or whatever but they wonder they wonder if it what does it refer to what does it refer to what does it refer back to it, it, it here refers to the corpse of the dead what is the corpse what's the corpse of the dead the body the dead body of the dead this dead body has already died on that mattress clear now who is who is wondering about this who's giving who's asking and wondering and questioning this it's the children the children who hurry by the children who gather around the mattress to watch and wonder why did the speaker see why did how did the speaker know that this was what they were talking and wondering the speaker says i here is the first i in the poem i used to when a boy i used to اعتدت على ذلك عندما كنت ولدا used to what does it uh, we call this ellipsis i used to what those who study discourse do you study discourse analysis i used to use you used to what the speaker he says i used to what is what is that that you have used to you wanted to say i used to hurry by the the throwing stuff of the dead out of curiosity i used to hurry by such mattresses which has been thrown out I used to in the discourse analysis there are some expressions that links the sentence to the previous sentence or the clause to the previous clause when the speaker said I used to I don't think so unless you be like I don't think so I don't think so you don't think what so refers to something already mentioned previously mentioned so you have to read before that you have to read before this in order to know what this what the, the word so refers back to I used to to do what I used to do that when I was a child when I was a boy now who is the speaker the speaker says I used to do that he used to to be a child who had to hurry by the the, the, the throwing stuff, the throwing mattresses out of the dead body's houses whenever there was an occasion. He used to do that as a child, now, or as a boy. Then, who is the speaker? Let's return to our question. The speaker. Is the speaker a man or a woman? I know Emily is the poet. I know that. But the speaker is not always the poet. Listen, it's not conditional that because the poet. Is a, is a woman that the speaker in the poem is a woman no 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 it's not conditional this is not conditional you cannot say that the speaker is a woman every time because the poet is a woman or the speaker is a man because the poet is a man that's not the way of it I know you will think that this is about the poet when somebody says, I used to be a boy and he used to do this and that, does, it, does this mean that the speaker is a woman or the sex of the speaker is not known? Huh? We have got a clue over here. This is the clue. I used to, I used to do that. I used to do, to wander around the, the, the throwing stuff of, of dead people when I was a boy. Now, a boy is a clue. A boy is a clue. You know the meaning of a clue. It's sort of like a key. An evidence. An evidence that proves that the speaker is not a woman. The speaker is a man. Yes. The speaker is a man. How do we know? I have got a clue. He says, I used to do that when a boy. When I was boy I used to wonder I used to hurry by the throwing stuff of the dead out of their windows and I 
used to wonder about these things, about everything the dead or the relatives of the house of the dead throw stuff out of the windows. I just had to gather around these thrown stuff and wander around them. That was my habit when I was a child, a boy. He said, a boy. This is a proof that the speaker is not Emily Dickinson. Who is the speaker? The speaker is a man. The speaker is a man who refuses to get out of his house, to go into the house of the relatives of the dead and give condolences. He refuses to do that. Why? It's not explained. It's not explained. Now, is this clear? Shall we move on? The minister goes stiffly in as if the house were his. And he owned all the mourners now and little boys besides. This is another observation. This is another. You see, the speaker keeps giving us observations. Children hurrying by the mattress. Our windows is open abruptly. The doctor drives away. The neighbors rustle in and out. All these are evidences and observations that make the speaker believe, uh, to his confirmation, that there has been a death case in the opposite house. These are all how he can reach to his conclusion. The minister. Now he's talking about the minister. Who is the minister here? You think this is the uh, minister of education, for example? No. Ministers here are the church men. Ministers are the church men. Normally, before people have to be sent to the grave, they send for uh, someone who has to pray the last prayer for this dead man. You know, funeral prayers. We call them funeral prayers. Funeral. Funeral prayers. Salat ish, Shabab? Salat ish? You know, people before they are sent to the grave, for many uh, religious cultures, yes, Abdurrahman, that's right, Michelle. For many, for many uh, religious cultures, uh, before sending the dead to the grave to be buried, uh, they usually have to pray or to forward, to perform some funeral prayer. And in uh, the Christian world, because it's clear that it's they are Christian, they have a minister. They don't have a sheikh. They don't, they don't pray the normal Muslim prayers. It's a minister. And here the minister is uh, non-negotiably the churchman. The one who is, you know, who comes from the church. What do they call him? They call him the minister. Another observation is that the minister goes stiffly in. The minister goes stiffly, seriously in the house of the death. And the way he gets, the way he goes into the house is like as if the house were owned by him. As if he is the owner, as if he was the owner of the house. He, was, he goes in confidently, uh, very much um, uh, confident of his uh, need. The people need him, the people are in need of him, something like that. So he acts, he behaves like someone who owns the house. Everybody is waiting for his arrival, for the minister's arrival, because they think that this minister's prayer is good for the dead, is good for the funeral, is good for, the comfort, for comforting the soul of the dead. Because after death, usually, you know, people think about where the soul has to go. So they want at least to get comfortable about uh, about the about the dead and uh, about its soul, his soul, so they bring in the minister to pray for the dead. And he owned all the mourners now. And he owned all the mourners now. Who are the mourners? Mourners are people who gather to cry or to mourn the loss of the dead. Mourners are the people who come to visit the, pe the dead and, sorry, the relatives of the dead and, you know, try to give condolences. Al Mu'azzin, mourners, people who gather in the house of the dead in order to give condolences, in order to, to cry also. Sometimes they have all, or, or, 
only to come to cry, to uh, comfort the relatives of the dead. So the speaker says, he, he refers to the minister. The, the minister now, not only, he, not only that he owns the house, but he owned all the mourners. He owned all the mourners now. How does he own them? He controls everybody in the house. And he's got little boys besides. Well, how does he control them? Why does he own them? And what does he do with the little boys? You know, these are questions that normally Muslims cannot answer because we don't practice this with our dead people. So the minister has to come and pray, and their prayer is singing, by the way. Their prayers is singing. I think you understand this. Christians in the church, when they go to pray, they sing. They have musical instruments in the church. Musical instruments. Because they have to sing. They think that singing, prayer through singing, is the best way to praise God. The minister controls everything in the house, including the mourners who have to come and repeat after him the songs, and the boys. The boys are needed to chant the songs of the funerals. That is how they pray for the dead. Well, how do they pray? They sing. Have you attended a funeral prayer? Funeral prayer, but in the uh, funeral Christian prayers. Have you attended that? Have you heard about that? They sing. It's okay because it's in the media. You can see that. You can watch this around, even in their movies. So even in their movies, when they go to the church, what do they do? Do they pray? Do they pray our prayers? Do they frust prostrate and kneel and? Do they do that? No. They sing. That's right. It's in the media. It's in the media. You can watch this even on the movies. So the boys and the mourners are needed and controlled by the minister because the minister cannot sing alone. He wants the mourners and the boys around him. He has to sing. The mourners have to repeat. The boys have to repeat. It's okay. The same. The boys are. The boys repeat and. Uh, you know, the, um, the mourners have to repeat after the minister. This is how, how the prayers of the funeral takes place, either in the house of the funeral or in the church. It's both sides. But normally they do that in the churchyard. Normally. They sing in the churchyard. They, you know, say, they say some prayer and then they start singing. Is this clear now? Well, is it, isn't it a proof that a minister who goes into the house, isn't it a proof that there has been a death case in that house? Isn't this a clear proof, an evidence, that there has been death in the opposite house? This is how the speaker wants, this is what the speaker wants to prove. What does he to, wants to prove? He wants to prove that there is a death in the opposite house. Is it by going out? No. By just observation, through observations, only through observations. And that's why he's just listing a group of observations to, to the conclusion that there has been death in the opposite house. What is the following observation? I mean, um, what else does the speaker observe? To come or to make him go to the conclusion that there is that there has been death in the opposite house. The milliner. Who is the milliner? The milliner is the person who makes or sells women's hats or hats. It's about hats. Someone who has to make and use and sorry and sells hats, women or men. But here it's for women. The milliner is a person who sells hats. Well, what is the business of a milliner in the funeral? Then the milliner and the man of the appalling trade. Now, maybe you've got to know something about, about uh, Christian funeral. 
They believe that uh, in Christian, of course, according to Christians, according to Christians, they believe that when uh, when saying goodbye to the dead person, they put on very fine and nice clothes on the dead. They put on him a jacket, trousers, tie, a shirt, and a hat. Before they shroud him into the coffin, they have to put on some very fine, maybe the best and the finest clothes for the, for the dead. Now, that, that's not the Muslims. That's the Christians. Today, I'm talking about Christians' world today. They don't shroud him in coffin like us, like Muslims. You know, we have the shroud. You know, a kefin. Ta'ifun al kefin. So, before sending the dead man to the grave, they put on the nicest, the, the most expensive suits and, and, and clothes on that dead man's body. On the corpse, taban. It's corpse. Why? Because they think they have to give him the last goodbye address, the last goodbye farewell. Say so, so they put on they put on the, the the best dress and the best clothes on this dead body. Now, do we do this? Do we practice this for, for Muslims? We don't do that. Muslims never do this. So we just have to clean him, wash him, right? We give him a, a complete wash, and then we shroud the, 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 the body into a coffin. The speaker mentions about one of the Christian's customs. What is it? They put on clothes. They ask for the tailors, for the uh, stylists to design the best suit for the dead. Why? Because they want to get him to the, into the finest shape before looking into him or, or giving him the last look and into the coffin. So they need a milliner. They need a tailor. The milliner and the tailors are advisedly, are advisedly to be in the, the funeral because they had to, decide, to design a new suit for the dead. They have to put on these clothes on the dead so that, you know, the dead goes to the grave in the finest shape, in the best shape, in the most beautiful and handsome, smart shape. Uh, the milliner is invited the, with the, with, with, along, alongside with the tailor. And now, the man of the appalling trade. The man of the appalling trade. The man of the, the most dreadful trade. Appalling means dreadful, fearful. Then the man of the appalling trade. Who is the man of the appalling trade? He is the grave man. The man who is responsible for digging up the grave for the dead. Well, well, why should the man come? Because the man has to take the measurement, the measurement of the dead. Because usually they have to put, to, to put the dead into a coffin, a casket, sort of like a casket. Have you heard of the casket? Casket. They put the dead into a casket, wood, made of wood. The, the Christian put the dead into the casket. And the casket has to be uh, made of wood, and then the casket is put in the grave. We don't have caskets in our Islamic culture. So, who is supposed to take the measures of this casket? The grave man. So they ask the man, they, they bring the man, and the, the, which the poet calls him, or the, who the poet calls him, the man of the appalling trade, the dreadful trade, the trade of the caskets. Because he's got to take all the measurements of the man, of the dead man, or the dead woman, and according to these measurements, he has to design or to design a new, a new, a new casket for the dead man. All right, all right. Why? In order to be sent to the grave. So here, to take the house, to take the measure of the house. What house? What house? The house they are living? Yes, it's the casket. It's there. I mentioned this. 
I have already mentioned this in, in, in footnote 33. So the speaker here also can notice that the man of the appalling trade has been invited in, and this means something. This means that there has been death in the opposite house. You know, all of these observations prove one thing for the speaker. They prove that there has been death in the opposite house, and the, the speaker keeps on giving more and more evidences. To take the measures of the house, there will be that dark parade. There will be that dark parade. What is parade? Parade. Parade is a procession of people. Parade is sort of like queues of people walking behind each other. A parade. Have you heard of a military parade? Uh, translation. Public procession. Public procession. Especially one celebrating a special days or event and including marching bands and floats. They're, they're going to send them to the graveyard, to the churchyard. Why dark? Why do they call him dark? Why does the speaker consider this dark parade to be about dark? He can foresee that it is a, a dark parade because in Christianity, mourners have to wear dark. Everything, everything the mourners wear have got to be dark. Everything the mourners wear or drive is supposed to be dark. Are you following? Are you following? Everything, yeah, usually, it's not always dark. It could be black, it could be dark blue, it could be dark gray, but in any way, it has to be dark. Well, is this a Muslim or a Christian habit? It's a Christian habit. It's not Muslim's habit. It is not a Muslim habit. It is a Christian habit. So, what, what happens in the parade? You'll find dark cars and dark coaches, dark tassels, dark suits, people in dark suits, men in black. Now, here, parade is not finished. I have to finish the word parade of what? Parade of tassels and of coaches soon. Parade of tassels. What are tassels? Look at the picture. You see the, can you see the tassels over here? This is called tassels. This is called Tassel. It's an ornament. It is an ornament. Something that we ornament our cars and our houses with. You following? What do they need this for? They need this for ornamenting the, you know, the casket. They need to ornament the casket. And also, they need this for the ropes. Because the, the, the procession has to be connected by a rope. And the, the rope has to go around the procession. Or let's say so that it's the procession is not broken. The procession is not broken by passerbys or by passengers. So they need ropes and tassels. And everybody in the street has to know that this is a, a death procession. And the dead has to go to the, has to reach the churchyard. Coaches. What are coaches? You can see that. You can see the coaches over here. It's a long car. It's a long car. It's a long vehicle, usually black. And it is designed for transforming, for transforming the dead body from their houses to the churchyard or to the graveyard. Following? So it's a long vehicle. It's a sort of like a car. It's between a car and a van. It's not a, it's not a car. It's a long vehicle, usually in black, and normally it is designed for the single purpose of transforming the, uh, the dead to the churchyard. So the speaker can guess, the speaker can foresee, can predict. The man who is speaking in the poem can predict that very soon there's going to be a dark parade. Now, has it started? Can you notice that? No. He does not notice this. He just predicts it. You know, to predict it's something different from noticing. No, he says there will. There will means in the future. In other words, 
he can predict that there is going to be a dark parade of coaches and tassels. But when? Very soon. It's going to be very near. It's going to be very clear because, you know, usually the dead will not remain in the house. Usually the dead will need a, co uh, a coach to send it to, this, to the churchyard or to the graveyard. And normally there's going to be a parade. What is parade? We said it's a procession. Is that clear? Here, the first, the last line of the f uh, of this previous stanza or quotient is ended over here. See, the sentence starts from the last line of the quotient and ends in the first line of the following of the subsequent qu uh, quotient. There will be that dark parade of what? Of tassels and coaches soon. Well, let's get to his conclusion. It's easy as a sign. It's very easy to predict that. It is very easy to predict, to predict, this, to predict this because predictions of this, uh, it's very easy as a sign to know that there has been death in the, in the house. Why? Because of, the fall of all of the observations, because of all of the observations noticed so far. All of the observ observations can tell that there has been death in the opposite house and this cannot go for wrong because I am sure, the speaker says, I am sure there's, go there's a death case in the opposite house. And it's very easy as a sign. The intuition of the news in just a country town. The news, the spread of the news will be soon very quick. With the news of the death of this of any if anybody in a country town is not like the news of the death of anybody in a city, because in a city almost barely anybody can know anybody. In a country town, it's very easy, it's very quick for the news of the death of anybody to spread. Following. In a country town. It's very easy, and it's very quick also, that the news of the death of anybody will spread across the city, across the town. Unlike a city, when we have weak links and connections with each other, because in the city, barely anybody knows anybody except for families. But here, everybody in the town almost knows everybody. So we 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 grow in support in the villages of the town. People are. Uh, united, sort of like united, they know each other, they always support each other. So the speaker says here, I don't have to get out of my house in order to know if there is a death case in the, in the opposite house, because these are evidences, these are proofs, and these are signs that there has been death in the opposite house, and the news of the death will not slow down. The news of the death will spread as quickly as fire in dry grass. Clear. Is that clear, brother? Questions? Shall we go to the questions? Or should I leave the questions for you? Because it's already 9.37. Should I leave the questions for you? Because even the questions over here have got answers below. Each question is, is provided with answer. We've got something like 12 questions or 10 questions, the, all of the questions is provided with an answer. 